Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Man on Second podcast. My name is Eric Wiedeka. As always, I am joined by Joe for sorrow on a on a uh, rather dreary, I must say, uh, Saturday evening. The uh, the weather outside kind of matches the vibe uh, in the Marlins fan base right now. Uh, but all in all, I, th- I think today is going to end up being you know a bittersweet day. Uh, you had Max Myers debut. And we actually just saw Yuri Perez uh, pitch a really solid second inning in the Futures game. Uh, so a- any any wins we can get today, we'll take them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We wanted to do this tonight. You know, a uh, busy weekend with the MLB draft. As, as Eric noted, we're, we're recording this Saturday night. Sunday night will lead into the All-Star break. Obviously, MLB's kind of scrambled things up. They've kind of squished everything together. Futures game on Saturday, the draft. MLB draft uh, tomorrow night, and then um, you know, then the All Star break with Sandy Alcantara. As we know now, Jazz Chisholm Jr. will not be playing. That's not a real shock, considering he never you know got fully back. And Garrett Cooper representing the Marlins in the All Star game. But we're going to start obviously. Um, Eric, I was down there at the ballpark today. Saw all you know five and a third kind of took off after that. And like Eric noted on the way home. Uh, lightning and rain. I beat the rain. It's 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 uh, pretty nasty outside, but you know we're we're here and we're we're going to bring a good podcast. And yes, the the major league debut of Max Meyer did not necessarily go the outcome that people thought. But I'm going to add some perspective and and some just to remind. It's a major league debut, regardless whether it's a ten nothing loss or whatever. It, it should in Max's world uh, be viewed as as an amazing, amazing accomplishment for all these players to, to reach this level, to get to this point. But, you know, it, you know, five and a third innings tagged with five runs. Now two of them were inherited runners that were brought in. Uh, but to me, he looked composed. Um, you know, he, he looked up to the part, but you know, there, there's a little bit of, you know, concern right now, whether he's fully developed and ready for what he's about to face in the big leagues. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I. I think. I think to be to be completely fair to Max, I think he certainly pitched better uh, than his than his run line will will ultimately look like. Uh, you know, because he was through the first four innings or so, he was he was uh, looking pretty good, and then you got to that that second, you know, time through the order, and all of a sudden, you know, maybe he just wasn't quite as sharp. Uh, I do think one of the things today, uh, when it comes to Max. Uh, I believe he only walked one batter. Yeah, and I think that there just just my impression because Max did have that reputation in, in the minor leagues of if there was a knock on him, you know, he could lose the strike zone a little bit. He had a, some control issues. I think he might have he might have been in the strike zone a little bit too much today uh, at times, and I think that that's probably where he got got hurt the most. Uh, but ultimately, uh, I was ex- I was I was glad to see the 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 slider as advertised um you know mid to to upper 90s fastball i think 97 was the highest he got on the day Mm -hmm. uh like like you said he looked composed listen he's got the attitude that's going to play at the major league level i'm confident that he'll at least make the adjustments and i don't think anybody should expect him to be sandy uh right away but i i don't think he's going to look uh like he doesn't belong at this level i think i think he he is gonna at least look like you know a major league pitcher yeah yeah um he's a rotation piece yep. probably more middle to back end uh but this is like you know uh it, it's kind of funny because you got you know the minor leagues with the pitch clock yep and there's a really fast pace yeah, Big he works obviously quick. doesn't he was getting the ball and he was going <laughs> and and I was really noticing that. And I'm like, this is refreshing because this could be a fast game. And that's what everyone seemed to love about the pitch clock at the, at the minor league level. So the pace is there to, to throw. Um, like you said, I was, I'm probably most impressed that the economy of pitches, meaning he was like 50 something pitches, like in the fifth inning, yep. uh, got to, I think the final total was what about 79, I believe uh, pitches thrown total. Um, and 53 strikes. And, you know, obviously the sixth inning is when he ran into to trouble. Um, 
I did like reach out to a veteran scout of uh, one of those 30 year type guys who who's seen a lot. And uh, just a quick thumbnail, his reaction. He said he has three to four, meaning a you know third to fourth starter type stuff. He says he needs to show more com- consistent command. And if there has been a, a knock, it's it's kind of been you know, the fastball command and that fastball tends to get hit and it was hit in the minor leagues too. Uh, the changeup still got to be a pitch that, that he's got to work on. Uh, this isn't a finished product. No. And I think that's what you're getting at Eric. He's not a finished product. And I think that's what people have to keep in mind. And, you know, um, like you said, the, the 96.5, I think is what stack has had it for the max, but his fastball average 95 and, I noticed 39 sliders, uh, 49% of his pitches, basically. 28 four-seam fastballs and 12 change-ups. So the change-up's going to be the big pitch for him because otherwise you don't want to be the two-pitch pitcher. Right. And if the fastball is a, is either flat or not, then hitters will start trying to take the slider away and just not not bite on it and wait for him to, to throw something in the zone with a fastball. But overall, the way the ball came out of his hands, the way he conducted himself to get into the sixth inning, all very, very encouraging and, and a real good learning experience because the Marlins challenged him, obviously. They gave yep. him a, a Phillies lineup with the real Mutos and the the Schwarbers, although, you know, you know, he got Schwarbers, the real Muto got him. The Castellanos is the Reese Hoskins. And it's ironic because Hoskins is his first big league strikeout. But then Hoskins also took him deep. And, you know, so it, it's, you know, it's going to be challenging for Max, but I am not discouraged at all. I saw a lot of encouraging signs by Max that, you know, I think he's going to be a fine big league starter. And, you know, I think the Marlins have just another good one. Yeah, I mean, listen, there's no shame in, in you know, getting beat by the guy that, pretty much beat Sandy uh, by himself yesterday in JT Rio Muto. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, you're going to get beat by those guys at the big league level. And he got Rio Muto the first time around. Yes. Um, but that's the thing. And and that's the thing that's really going to, that Max is going to, and it's, and it's one of the big hurdles that pitchers when they get to the big league level, just have to, you know, it's one of those things that they have to, to learn how to do is navigate the lineup the second, third time around. Uh, because it's it's one thing to come out and you look like, oh man, you've got your sharp your first time through. Well, what do you? How are you going to adjust when the guys have seen you once already? So yes. that's 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 the next step I think for Max. Um, you know, it's it's not much different than any other young pitcher. Like you said, uh, I, I think this was an encouraging uh, start overall, despite what the uh, the ledger looks like. Um, and I think, like you said, they got another good one. Yeah, and and I thought it was interesting. I know the people go nuts on Twitter because they see Jacob's, Jacob Stallings catching him. But clearly it was a decision to get the seasoned veteran catcher that can navigate the pitcher. This is what Stallings, you know, obviously if he's not going to hit, you know, he's, he's got to do the job, which he gets a lot of credit for with Sandy. And, you know, and, you know, he's – I thought it was a good call to get him to kind of mentor and get him through, you know, into the sixth inning. I mean, that's, you know, not all these, you know, first starts. Cause I was like, you noted, I was a little concerned. I thought he was going to kind of get real amped up, probably throw a lot more balls than he did and maybe be out of the game before four innings right. because of pitch count, you know, maybe not give up a ton of runs, but maybe some really stressful innings. But, it, you know, I think the first thing was like 16 pitches, 12 strikes. I mean, he was, you know, like you said, he was get ball and go. So the fact he was so in the zone and I thought he worked really well with Jacob Stallings today. Um, and, and and again, you know, uh, they challenge him. I, it, I This is something I want to bring up too, Eric, uh, talking to him, being part of the interview. And the interview is up on the Five Reasons Sports uh, uh, YouTube channel, the, the three, four minute interview with, with uh, Max on Friday when he was introduced, uh, you know, as coming up. His demeanor, and you could tell he's like a lot more humble in spring training. He was a lot more, hey, I go get him. I'm going to strike everyone out. I'm going to dominate everyone. I'm, you know, I'm the next great thing, which is I see in a lot of young players that, you know, strike out a lot of guys in the minor leagues. But he seemed to be realized like, hey, don't, you know, don't put myself out there, you know, be humble, you know, prove, you know, see this level. 
and don't give anybody any more ammo to, to come after you. And, and I thought that a little bit different temperament, a little more of a flat line guy. And, and he's going to need that because it's going to be the big leagues are, are cruel. And we hope he has a long big league career. And to do that, you gotta, you're going to have days you get really good and days you take your lumps. And, and it's how you conduct yourself every day is what people look at, you know, in the clubhouse and your, your teammates, what the opposition's looking at as well. And, and I think Max passed all that. Keep in mind, 23, wearing number yep. 23. And and overall, I hope in his mind, you know, he's not like a yippee, you know, I got my butt beat, five nothing, you know, five runs and five and third. Right. But looks at it as I'm enjoying my opening, you know, my big league opener and my, my major league debut because it's regardless, you only get it once. And, right. you know, and make it make it something. It'll be a learning one for him. But, I, you know, I've seen guys get overly, oh, I, you know, hurt the team. You, you know, you just you just got to cherish and, and remember that it is your debut and you worked and all your support group that got you to this point. It's their day as well because they are all there and your family, they're celebrating with you. And um, and well, let's segue over to another guy because we were just watching like Eric alluded to before we hit the record button. Uh, Yuri Perez. Yep. Uh Number one prospect on the Marlins, and certainly probably a top fifteen. Num- not I top think he's 10. number nine right now, according to Pipeline. In overall, yeah. Okay, well, it's about time, you know. And uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, this is you know, we we've talked about him. I've talked about him with David Fernandez on on my you know the prospect podcast. Nineteen years old, you know, he's another Sandy in the making. Uh, like you said, ninety nine today, and my instant analysis uh, from scouts that. Uh, or watching him at the moment, you know, he only pitched that one inning, you know, just they, they know just the ease with the delivery, the control of the body for being that big. Cause a lot of times tall pitchers, sometimes he's everything to go right. You know um, you know, it's easy to fall out of sync, but a uh, real feel for the change up breaking ball is still developing and it's already pretty good. Um, and, you know, he's tough to pick up, which is deception, which, when you're six foot nine, it's a very uncomfortable at bat for hitters. Think Yuri, what he got one, two, three, a, yep. a ground ball, a fly ball, and a strikeout or in, or in sequence. It was a, yep. a, the ground ball, the, the strikeout, and, and then, then, and then the, the pop out. Yeah. So it was, uh, again, really, really promising. You can see him smiling, having fun. He's at Dodger Stadium, you know, kind of glancing. If you see me, I'm glancing. I've got the game on him. There are other prospects in the game I want to see too, but uh, it's, uh, Great day for Yuri Perez and a reminder that the Marlins have some pitching on the way. And 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 Eric, I want to first your thoughts on Yuri. Yeah, no, I think Yuri, I think Yuri showed the entire arsenal. Um and, and and you know, it's 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 really encouraging when you know I, I mean there are there are guys that you get excited about at the minor league level, uh, and then there are guys that are that are really, really special. And Yuri looks like one of those guys that can be really, really special. Uh, so I think that, that should be a really good sign for Marlins fans because Yuri looked like he looked like a big league pitcher pitching to, you know, uh, minor league all stars. That's it. That's that's kind of how it how it looked to me. Um, so I, he's a guy that if we're just going off of talent alone, he could be in the big leagues right now. Uh Obviously, they shouldn't and they won't do that. Um, but I, I mean, twenty three looks I realistic. Yeah, I, I exactly. Twenty three looks realistic. Whether yeah. it's opening day, which may be optimistic, but uh, which I want to raise this question to you as we we kind of you know segue back to the big club, and you know we, we saw what just happened in this home stand. Obviously, they have a game tomorrow. Uh, you know, haven't necessarily got swept by the Phillies. They're five, I believe, out now. Uh, you know, kind of struggle wins against the Pirates and some real ugly, you know, to, to split that four games. Um, you could put a happy face on and say, look, they're getting closer. Um, it's a, still an uphill battle to get that wild card, that final wild card, which pretty much to me is all they're playing for. Um, I do think the offense will get a little better in the second half and so forth. But I, I raised this to you because if I'm the Marlins, I, I think you kind of have to be realistic about 2022 and you got to look at 23 as 
You got Sandy Alcantara, who's going nowhere. But do you move Pablo Lopez or or and or both Trevor Rogers and really try to make some moves to to bring in impact coming in? And then you kind of got your eyes on Edward Cabrera, Yuri Perez, Max Meyer, um, you know, Jesus Lizardo, uh, you know, um, Braxton Garrett. You know, do you do you think those terms? Because I'm kind of leaning that way. I'm kind of like be bold. You know, yeah. maybe it's time to say 2022 isn't the time. But if you could get the biggest return from Pablo and Trevor, or and or, then I'm probably going there. And if I have to move, you know, Miggy Rowe as well to get a center fielder and be a little more athletic team. I think I'm going that way. And then you kind of see how the second half plays out, but you you're playing more for 23. People may not want to hear it, but you got to be realistic. It's just, you know, it doesn't really matter what happened three years ago or patience. You, this is not the year to lose your mind or let an opportunity waste itself to, to make upgrades. Listen, um, when Sandy Alcantara signed his five-year, fifty-six million dollar extension, that's that's the clock. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's 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 the clock that started ticking. Um, and I think it's I think it would be short-sighted when looking at this roster and evaluating what you have, uh, you know, in, in a in a holistic manner, to say, yeah, well, let's just you know let's sacrifice the next couple of years to to go and be as good as possible this year. I, I don't think that this is the team to do that with. I think that you are trying to be good for uh, 23 and even possibly 24 because uh, you want you really want to be hitting your stride in, in year two, year three of that Sandy contract. Um, Pablo's an interesting name uh, when it comes to dealing him because, like you said, you can get a really, really solid return for Pablo. Um, I also, and I want to run this, run this by you because you know I, I i thought of and i know that he doesn't have the same kind of stuff as like a zach gallon uh but i would i would not be opposed to a you know let's say braxton comes out and throws another you know has one or two more good outings i think if if somebody's willing to and they get caught up in oh man this guy's pitching really well he's a former first round pick and they're willing to give you something of value for a guy like him I think he's probably the first guy that I would look to move in in, in any uh, scenario in kind of that Zach Thompson, Zach Gallen, Caleb Smith kind of uh, mold. Trade high, yeah, exactly. Deal deal him high. Um, but if somebody gives you a king's ransom for Pablo, I don't I don't see how you can really turn it down at this point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're basically if you move Pablo, you're probably not going to win it right. this year, but. Yeah. You got to, I think, think that way. You meaning yeah. that he has to be in your mind because Pablo has a history of breaking in the second half as well. Um, that, okay, can we move Pablo still kind of be in the fringe, you know, to be in the wild card picture this year? Because keep this in mind that, you know, do you honestly think they're going to finish with a better record in the Cardinals, Giants, Phillies? Because if they're not, it's all over. Right. You know what I mean? If it, They have to be over all of them, basically. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, it has the math. I, I might be missing the team. But, uh, yeah, no, the, you got to figure yeah. the Mets and the Braves are in. There, you got to yeah. think the, the Giants, excuse me, the uh, Dodgers and the Padres are in. Yep. And then the Brewers or the Cardinals, one of them are in, but very good chance both are in. And right. then it's over. Right. Yeah, so you're you're literally fighting for that one spot, and are you going to allow that? This might be the time to to go give Pablo, you know, not give him, but trade him to the Yankees, and then go get um, you know a center fielder. Yeah, um, I think they have a Floreal. I think is a Triple A guy. Yep. Um, they they got him, and you know maybe you try to get Andujar as well. You know now you got an interesting trade, and maybe something else. Um, you know, you, you could do trades like that uh, yeah. and then get yourself a lot better. And then maybe if you only move Pablo, you hope Trevor finds his stride because, you know, he's still throwing the ball pretty well. Yeah. And and if not, you know, you, you know, at least you got some offensive pieces 
and you got some pitching and you hope that Cabrera can stay healthy, Lazardo can stay healthy, and and then you got stuff, and then you got Eater coming back next year. Yep. And and then, you know, whoever else could be in the pipeline, but you're you're kind of protected yourself. Yeah, I think I think as far as as far as that goes, I'm I'm more inclined to listen to offers on Pablo than Trevor, just for the fact that you know, I feel like dealing Trevor now is almost is almost doing a disservice. Uh just because but you think you're selling them low. Exactly. And see, I, I, I see you, I and I get that. And you could look at the numbers, but when you look at the big league teams aren't looking at it as kind of more of the fans. They're they're looking at it as, you know, this is <laughs> A young guy, controllable. Uh, we we know what it is. Right. And everybody's like, yeah, we might be able to talk the Marlins down a little bit, but we also know this guy was an All Star a year ago. We know he could throw ninety seven from the left side. You know, controllable and all that other good stuff. Right. The Marlins will get a lot for him. Okay. Even even, I, I you know because the teams, let's say you're the the, the Cardinals or whatever, and you're you're fighting for that. You're not going to sit around and go, oh boy, we, we really do. We really want to get there. You know, right. they're going to be teams that are, and maybe even the Mets or someone. You know, Absolutely. might you might say that that we need to we need to protect ourselves, and we're going to bank on our pitching guy is going to help fix them. You know, Mel didn't connect with him; he's connected with everyone else, but not him. Uh, right. You know, you, you could. I I don't think. Let me make that clear. I don't think the Marlins would be selling low on on Trevor. Rogers. Okay. I think. Okay. I think that. The fact that that now is the time to, to to really kind of make a shrewd baseball trade, you know, because you could probably get the Marlins have a good scouting department. That you could probably get, you know, really good value for Trevor. Obviously, yeah. I think you're getting more for Pablo. But uh, right. while I say that, I did get my Trevor <laughs> bobblehead today. You know, he looks like a pretty good bobblehead. It's the yeah, no, I've ever seen on a on a bobblehead. But, oh wow, um, you know, yeah. And I and I don't know if you noticed, but I got my my merch, the City Connect shirt. Yep. So you know, so we're we're repping uh, today. But uh, yeah, just kind of your, you know, you can follow up on those thoughts there. But yeah. again, like I said, I think I, I mean, be fine. yeah. As as far as this team goes, if if I'm, I, I mean, I'm looking at this team as 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 hard sellers. Um, and I don't, and I and and, and I don't mean to say that in a. As long as this, as long as the rotation is what it's going to be for the next few years, which for the most part, uh, you're looking at Sandy, and then you're looking at any combination of of you know, any of the other guys in the rotation, they should be they should have at least a competent rotation for the next four or five years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I do think that there's a, a a higher floor built in on this team, uh, just because of the pitching that's there. Uh, I got a lot of I, I you know I always. I always float the idea of, you know, deal Garrett Cooper while you can, uh, because I just don't know. I don't know how much value he presents to the, to the roster as currently constructed, you know, over the next year, two years, three years, what have you. Um, and, and people always, always kind of, uh, bite back on me for that. But I just, like I said, I don't see the long-term fit for Garrett Cooper. I think he's a good player. I think he's a player that, you know, teams would be interested in uh, if the Marlins were to dangle high. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's where the, I think that's where the Marlins ought to be looking at because I, and I don't think it's going to ruin the on-field product all that much because you look at what they're doing offensively right now, you know, I'm positive. They're going to, they're going to improve too in the second half, because quite frankly, uh, you can't get much worse than they've been at least to finish out the first half. Yeah. You know, they, they were a competent offensive ball club in, in June uh, mm-hmm. certainly. And I, and I think they still can be that, but you know, just from how many cornerstones do you have right now on the roster in the field? Jazz. Uh, jazz is about it. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at my phone, Eric, because you, because you mentioned Cooper's going, you know, after today, Hitting 287. Remember, he was like yep. 320 a couple of weeks ago. Seven homers, 40 RBIs. OPS is now 794. Yep. And his career, 283 lifetime, 37 homers, and 1,078 at bats, uh, 804. So he's yep. not the 30 homer guy people thought. Um, he's probably not a 300 hitter, but he's a good solid two, 280 hitter. Yep. Um, you know, his last seven games, he's hitting no 45. He's one for 22. Last 15 games, he's hitting 157 and 51 at bats. So, 
Um, again, I think a lot of it, his BABIP, really, when he had that great uh, June, when he hit like 378 in June, yep. the BABIP was like over 400. Uh, so he seems to be either 400 or 200. And, and he's kind of been that kind of player. Uh, and then it evens out. It settles about 270, 280. Uh, right. To your point, you know, you know, they have Aguilar. They have Cooper. Cooper's clearly like social media's choice. But, you know, Aguilar is the proven 100 RBI guy. Uh, would I be, if they move both of them, are they a better team? You get Lewin Diaz up here, left-hander. You can move one of the two, and you're going to at least create a platoonish right. lefty, lefty, better defensive player. Um, I, I've mentioned this a lot. I think they need to be a little more athletic, and that doesn't mean you just need a bunch of speed guys. But we see what happens when you know when let's say it's birdies on and Cooper's batting second. There's no really first to third after that. It's hard to, to you know the middle of your order coming up. Um, you know, Soler and Garcia are the ones who the public likes to really beat up on. And, and you know, rightfully so. They're making the, the most money. I will say this. For Soler being at the game today um, and even at the game last night, for as much time as he's missed, he is his timing is not off by much. He's fouling off pitches. Like, you know, and then he hit, well, he hit a ball 111 today. Off oh, the yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think Garcia went 107. Uh, but but Soler, I, I can see him kind of dialing it in, getting on those five homers in three game type of stretch. Um, and, you know, once you start creating traffic, creates opportunity for Garcia, who who has been doing better later in games than he does earlier in games, at least in terms of grinding at bats. But the slugging isn't what it should be. And they miss they miss jazz. There's no question yeah, about it. Absolutely. And now they miss birdie because they have no yep. no sparks. Uh, so it, the offense, I think is going to have to just kind of, just kind of tread water as best they can. They try to keep their head above water, uh, until jazz gets back until birdie. But I, to your point, are they a better offense? We know what this, this offense has looked kind of the same for since 2020, even yeah. in the, even in the shortened season. Yeah. They went to the playoffs. We could crow about that, but you know, you know, do you really want, that carbon copy of a first baseman that you have. Right. Because I, look I, at everybody else's first baseman. Look at if, if people want to look at batting average, fine. But I'm looking at slugging and OPS and 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 home runs. You know, it's like you yeah. that's that 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 position the way this roster's constructed needs to produce more than seven homers or and I think Aguilar doesn't have much more than seven homers either. I, you know and it's and the question isn't uh, and I hate to and I hate to frame it this way, really. The question for me isn't does the offense get better if Cooper or Aguilar are gone? It's does the offense really get worse if those guys are gone? Are they are they really are they really, you know, you know, super impactful guys? And that's that's where I struggle to to because I would rather I would rather, you know, you you don't you know what Cooper and Aguilar are. You, you, mm -hmm. they're known quantities at this point. I think it's time to give Lewin an extended look, you know, kind of understand what you have there. At the very least, he's got the profile that he can be uh, an impactful bat, at least from what we've seen in the minors. Uh, his stints in the majors have been really too short to, to make any kind of long-term uh, decisions on, on him. Really. I, I just, I, I don't see the 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 huge impact from from Cooper and Aguilar and those guys being in the middle of the order. You're looking for that for that impact and that production. There's no doubt because this market tends to always kind of vilify the backup catcher. The guys hitting seventh in your order. Your younger guy. Now it's easy to beat up Jesus Sanchez and say, well, Cooper's given us two good months or whatever. Right. Uh, but you win and lose by the middle of your order. Yeah. You're, you're the top and middle. That those are your they're hitting there for a reason. Yeah. You know, it's like it's like an NFL team, you know, losing and blaming like their third down wide receiver, you know, dropping too many passes. 
and say that's why we lost all our games or whatever. It's like, no, you in the NFL, you win because you're quarterback and you got big play right. guys. You know, if you have more playmakers, you you win. Yep. You don't blame the the least of them. And we we love to do that. And we, you know, right. we, we've seen beaten up Chad Wallach or Jeff Mathis. We, we love to beat up the backup catcher. And but we never really blame or put point fingers at the people paid in the middle of the order. And yes, two of those guys were brought in from outside in Soler and Garcia. Now they have a bad first half, but those guys have track records of playing 162. And yep. let's see what the second half brings. Yep. And then you make a decision at the end of the year how far you want to go with, with that combo. But uh that's where you won. That's you know, you know, real muto, middle of the order, home run. Two Hoskins yeah. today, home run. Uh, you know, look at you know, who who do you count on to get the big hits? Not counting right. on your eighth hitter, your seventh hitter, or your your guy with you know less than a big, you know, basically a full year of big league service time, you you know, who isn't necessarily the the top ten prospect in baseball and then blame him for everything. Right. And 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 I and I guess I guess this is all a long, a really long way to say uh Garrett Cooper is a nice hitter. I think he's a good piece for for a team that wants to compete. Uh but you're not winning very many games with him as the best hitter in your order. I think that that's that's kind of, you know, where where we stand with that. When you're when you're relying on him to be, you know, the big production, that's just not who he is. He's gonna he's a good he's a good complimentary piece in any lineup. I think he's you know like you said career two two eighty four hitter. Uh, a lot of teams can use that career eight hundred OPS, uh, but. You know, if you're relying on on him to be your, you know, the best guy in your order, it's just your offense isn't going to be, you know, where you want it to be. Yeah, it's – and in fairness to Coop, you know, it's like this lineup's not deep enough. Right. So it magnifies. Absolutely. The fact that The fact that Miggy Rose numbers are down, Stallings has been a big disappointment. You're not getting production up and down that if a couple of your mainstays have a, a – a rough patch, um, you know, it, it kind of reflects on everyone. And I think that you are seeing it. Uh, and I think that's why you're, you're seeing the way teams are being built now and, and why you it's, it's hard to half rebuild, right? You kind of have to either fully take it down and build it up or do go for the super lineups. And this is, you know, kind of ties into like Juan Soto, the news that came out today about, Turning down what the fifteen years for forty or four fifty, yep. whatever it was, hundred million, uh, and why would Soto want to stay? Right, because he already his offensive numbers aren't. What's he is he hitting two thirty? I, I mean his um, OPS is way up there, but uh, you know it's like you put him on the Yankees or the Mets. Right. And then he's, you know, just walking into the Hall of Fame. He probably will do anyway. But, uh, you know, that enhances you. Stanton being the guy here with no one else. That's right. why you couldn't just keep Stanton and let everyone else go because you you it doesn't work that way. You you right. need to you need to stack up as much, which then that carries into your this is always a challenge with the offense. You're in a ballpark that was intentionally built to be a pitcher's park. Right. Previous ownership was hell bent on making this not a hitter's park and thought fans were going to love two, one games and yeah, they're loving them, but they're losing like 80% of those two, one games yeah. because the guys that are impacted the most are the ones who play there 81 games. Yeah. They're the ones the most demoralized and even moving the fences in three, three different times and lowering them. The ball doesn't carry. Right. You know, especially in the middle of the field. So you have – there were a couple of balls today that maybe the Solaire ball in Citizens Bank is an extra base hit, base hit because the outfielders are so deep anyway. Right. That is caught. Uh, Stott off of Max today is probably a homer in Philly. It was a double here. Uh, so it helps to some degree the splits of pitching, but is really the trade off to never really get hitters – the top line hitters that will want to say, yeah, I want to play here. Yeah. I want to play here and hit 15 homers instead of 25. You know, who wants to, you know, and it was intentionally built that way. Yep. No, I think, I think that's a great point. 
uh, as as far as when it comes to, you know, it's it's hard to it's hard to build the lineup that you want when you have to play in a in a park like this, you know, 81, 81 times uh, a year. And and it goes back to your point of you need to emphasize having uh, more athleticism in the lineup. You know, guys that if they could, if from they, first, yeah, uh, exactly. The if they, if, not, if they, not second, first. Yeah. If they if they put a ball in the gap, you know, they're looking three. Uh, or so it's you know, the Marlins kind of have to and, and it's and it's something that they kind of committed to when they built the ballpark like this. They need to zig when the rest of the league is is kind of zagging. Uh, you do need your power hitters, don't get me wrong, but you look at the Mets, for example, who are second who have the second fewest home run total uh in the National League. That's 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 what I think the Marlins uh offense ought to look like. Interesting point. And when you mention that, I'm I'm looking up a stat, uh team stats. If you're not gonna hit homers, Eric, you have to at least slug. Yeah. So you at least have to have extra base hits. And I think the Marlins as an organization, I'm looking up team slugging because you mentioned the Mets. Um the Mets came into today, I don't know if they played yet, 398 slug, which is 14th. The Marlins are 19th at 382. Um, not terrible. They actually are slugging a little bit better than the Rays, but obviously it seems to be all or nothing. You know, it seems like they had that big breakout game. Uh, it's not as consistent. Uh, who, you know, just a quick, the top, you know, five slugging teams, Braves 446 or one, Yankees 441 or two, Dodgers 435 or three, Blue Jays power type lineup in an easy ballpark 434, and the Twins 423 or fifth. Um, and you know, so you you need to have extra base hits. And yeah. I like when people say, "Oh, get line drive hitters." Well, it doesn't necessarily work because your kind of normal distance is no doubles. Right. And like Luke, I think it was Luke Williams today got. A double on a flare, and it was the overturn yeah, play. Yeah, almost, almost thrown out. Yeah, it was almost thrown out. It's still, you know, very close. Uh, but no left fielders playing him that date anywhere, right. but in this gigantic ballpark. So I'm sure the left fielders were like, oh, I guess this is a good spot. You know, it's like because I can see from the press box, I can see them. Right. That's why I right. can bring this up with perspective, and I really think some of these analytics people or whatnot. I know you can look at there's numbers and such should be in. Yes, there are in suites, but really kind of look at, at because I've noticed that from day one, if, you know, being in this press box since it opened in 12 and just noticing how deep the outfields play yeah, and how many balls. And you don't build for blues. You don't sit around because but you'll always hear the counter for the people who want to who build the argument that, yes, it's perfect. There are hits out there. Who sits around and says, you know what? We want to hit a lot of bloops. Yeah. You know, I want that jam shot. I want to be rewarded with that. You know, no, yeah. you want to be rewarded when you club the ball, you know, into the gap, but the center fielder just doesn't just run it down because he had so much room to run it down and he's playing deep, you know? Yeah. Well, that's that's the thing. I mean, and and, it, and again, um it hammers home your point of athleticism. Uh because and, and I know, you know, the Luke Williams example uh isn't necessarily the best one. But let's take Jazz, for example. Jazz is Jazz takes a lot of singles and turns them into doubles. Yes. Uh, the, as, and if you can get – not everybody's going to be able to do it like Jazz, don't get me wrong. Um, but guys like Jazz and, and even John Birdie, you know, just having that athleticism to, you know, let's say you hit a ball into the gap in left center. Like you said, the center fielder is going to be playing deeper. Jesus Aguilar hits a ball into the gap in left center and he's, he's confined to a single or a uh, double at most or a double at most. Somebody else is getting a triple. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, and if you notice who the two games that they, they had that streak were winning in the ninth inning or the 10th inning or 11th mm -hmm. inning and the place runner, the Billy Hamilton factor, you know, people that don't want him on this team. Well, with a 26 man roster, and now down to 13 pitchers, not 14. Yep. 
you could carry a Billy Hamilton just fine, and you see the way he's impacting a game with his yep. legs because they can't make any mistake. If they pick over, they throw over and throw it just a little bit away. He's on third. Yep. You know, I'm talking about a tie game. If he's on second, there's the pitcher stepping off. He's liable to make a mistake pitch now. He's, you know, all that other stuff. We saw him score from first. You know, get his eye busted up there. Is very cheap, but <laughs> yep. you know, you know, he took one for the team. Not that you know, the people that I love the people who don't like speed, but man, you need it. You need it, and you see what it does. Doesn't mean you don't get baseball players. Absolutely. But, you know, but you don't. You could get the plotting station to station guys, or you could get guys who offer a little different uh, dynamic, and and you see the difference that it makes. Luke Williams gets that double that other guys are thrown out on yep. today because he can run. Uh, I, I guess, I guess, I guess the point that that you and I are both making is if a guy is going to be slow and, and plotting, um, you know, at least, at least, at least let him be, you know, a, a legit power threat. You know, I'll take a Kyle Schwarber. Because Kyle Schwarber provides enough power to make up for the fact he's got twenty nine homers. Does, he he right makes now. up for it, yeah, uh, with so much power. But you know, guys that don't give you that much power, they have to give you something else. Yeah, you know. Yeah, well, it's like you didn't realize it at the time, but Jazz Chisholm Jr. is the perfect Lone Depot Park player. Absolutely. For one. It, the power plays better to the right side, you know, to left, mm-hmm. the right field for a left-handed hitter on the, especially pull. He can, he has enough power to go deep center yep. and he can run. Yep. He's one of the fastest runners in the league. So he's, he's got the, the power speed. I never, I never really, he's like, he's like the, the blueprint, not that you could find everyone with a complete skill set. Of like course. That, but you, if I'm the Marlins, I'm probably looking that way. Yeah, I don't want just oh a good gutsy single hitter because I you know I don't care about your batting average. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. Your batting average is nothing when, <laughs> especially 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 <laughs> yeah, especially if you're not if if all you're giving me is is a is a batting average and I don't and I'm not getting really solid base running or I'm not getting you know a dynamite glove. What are we doing in this ballpark? Yeah, and that you know it just it comes down to fit. It comes yep. down to fit. And I think the challenge, yes, we, we kind of going a little long, but we're, we're venting and ranting. But we, I think it's this really a healthy discussion that really I think our audience needs to hear. Um, that I really hope that Kim Ang and her staff are, are thinking in these lines of not just being cautious and saying, yes, uh, Soler can heat up. Yes, Garcia can heat up. And that all can happen. Maybe every Sanchi maybe heats up. And next thing you know, Jazz comes back and Wendell holds up and, and Miggy gets a little hot and they, let's believe in this roster and let's run it to the finish line. And, and you know, hopefully we get, you know, it, it's almost like, what was it, uh, semi-pro when the Will Ferrell was trying to be fifth place or whatever? Yep. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, I don't really think that should be the goal. <laughs> No, you have to have higher aspirations than that. And and I don't want to and I and again, I don't want to reopen old wounds. Uh but you know who I thought of when you mentioned perfect loan depot player and Marlins fans are going to hate this. He's on the Mets. Yeah. <laughs> well, Starling, Star, I, he's he fits the ballpark. Yeah. And then yeah, I go back to it too. Like the player didn't necessarily like the dollar figure although they paid bad dollar figures to other players. And I didn't like their process with him because they right. never seemed to really want him until right. it was like, oh, by default, they wanted him. Yeah. Want somebody, get the player. That's how I'm going to really judge the front office ultimately. Right. When they get the player they want, for better or worse, with conviction, not yeah. not just because, oh, uh, they're kind of ripping us on the radio because we didn't sign. You know, it's like, no, exactly. you, you get the player that's the best player for your team. Yeah, and really makes you a contender because we got some really passionate people who are just believing anything and they want any reason of hope, and, that, and that's what we're down and that's what we're down to. But like I said, my hope is that Yuri Perez, Sandy, uh, that's what I'm looking for. If I'm a Marlins fan, I anything you get from 2022 is gravy. If yep. they somehow make 
a run at it and are playing uh, into the final weekend and, and with a, any outside chance or a playoff. But man, my focus is really 2023 when Yuri's up here at some point and Sandy and Yuri and, and the others are, are ready to click. And now you have time to get a real, you know, real plan for a closer, uh, you know, to, to get your bullpen lined up rather than we're going in with a committee and then we'll wait and see and and then just make a, a run at it because there are enough Cincinnati Reds and Pittsburgh Pirates and uh, enough bad teams that are going to give you Washington Nationals are going to be easy wins for a while that are going to allow you to somehow win your share of games to be in that wild card mix. But do you want it? You don't, they're almost in a, if they don't make a move, like whether it's Pablo or, or Trevor or something like that by August 2nd, and they, they finish 10 under this year. And after collapsing the final week of the year, you don't want to be mediocre and you don't want right. to be right in that, that spot. Right. And because you're never really going to get, you're going to, you're drafting too low. You're, you're, you're going to waste, you know, prime years of players, and then you're going to lose some of them, the free agency. You're only X amount of guys you're going to sign. So you you got to kind of make a hard call and the right call. Yeah. I, and, and to be fair, I think, I think the fan base can, can kind of take, take solace in the fact that I think that they can still, I think that they can still accomplish uh, the goals that, that they have in terms of improving the roster uh, without being outright bad over the next three or four years. Cause I, I, I don't think they're going to be uh, really, you know, outright, you know, 50, 60 games won in a season over the next three, four years, just no. because of the rotation that they have. Yeah. I mean, um, even, even today was a close game until the late innings, you know, it yep. was like, a, you know, yeah. So yeah. Eric, this was a good one, buddy. Uh, Absolutely. We, we put a lot, in the, a lot out there. We, we gave them uh, again, you know, Max Meyer, we look forward to seeing him after the all-star break and see how that thing goes. Uh, we'll be back, you know, uh, I don't know. We, we may do one Monday. We'll see. We, we got a lot right. going on. Uh, depends what Eric wants to do, but we got the draft coming on Sunday and, and we're going to have a ton of content. Um, like subscribe, Eric, take us out of here, you know, and tell everyone how they can find us. Absolutely. So you can find all of our podcasts on the five reasons sports YouTube channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe there. It does grow our reach. Uh, and you can also find us on Twitter at man on second. That's going to be at man on two and D uh, where we provide uh, commentary as well as post clips of everything that you can see uh, the, on the full length podcasts. Uh, I do think uh, just one, one last note, uh, Edward Cabrera really solid night in double a three innings, uh, no hits, no walks, one strikeout. So another thing to look forward to, and we look forward to seeing you guys next time at, uh, maybe after the All-Star break, maybe on Monday.